Now, we have the, the very lovely Q Lee, uh, a guy who describes himself as a uh, Korean living in, uh, in California. Um, now, I actually first encountered Gameville probably back in 2004 when I was invited over to Seoul by one of the, uh, the agencies. And what's always struck me is there's a couple of really amazing things about the Korean market. They're absolutely crazy about games and they always do things that are just phenomenal, you know, particularly with the connectivity. There were two companies that at that time really grabbed my attention, of people who could really transition between the Korean market and the Western market. They were Come To Us and Gameville. And it's my great pleasure to have you with us today to talk to us about what I think is also one of the most interesting transitions. The next disruption that we will see is where does the publisher sit? And I think we're seeing some incredible change in the way that we can you know, deal with the difficulties of discovery as an independent developer so instead, do we look for publishers? Do we look for other market choices? And so this is the point to talk to the guys who understand this, and I will hand straight over. Thank you very much, Q. Thank you, Oscar. Um, so my name is Q Lee. I'm currently the vice president of Gameville, and I run uh, the Gameville USA operation. Um, as Oscar mentioned, I've been uh, with the company for about 14 years. I started in 2000 doing mobile games. And I moved over to the U.S. in 2006. So I, I hope I have a, a pretty balanced view on both the Eastern market and the Western market. I, have, I, I hope I have a pretty global view uh, on where the market is heading. And um, yeah, so when, when I was given this topic, uh, it's really, it was really uh, hard because like I don't, I don't know all the publishers out there, and I, th I, I just thought the best idea was to talk about um, our own story. And uh, so, please uh, excuse me if I'm talking too much about our company, but uh, and but I hope you um, get something out of it. So we were founded in uh, 2000. We currently have around 200 employees uh, with offices in Los Angeles, uh, Seoul, and Tokyo. Uh, we have around 200 million installs uh, across iOS and Android. Uh, our key titles are Xenonia, Baseball Superstars, and third-party titles like Cartoon Wars and Air Penguin. So we also have a Gameville Partner Fund. Uh, we, uh, we announced a $10 million partner fund in 2011 that we fully spent, and we announced another $10 million uh, Gameville Partner Fund. So, We've been doing like um, annually around 10 games per year internally, and uh, so we just started doing publishing in 2010. So in 2010, we published one third-party title, and last year we published 35 external titles. So um, most of so um, right now, like we have internally, if you just look at our internal development team, we have around 137 people doing actual game development. They're more focused on the core gaming categories. Uh, where uh, with third parties, we, we like to work with uh, a lot of variety of uh, different type of um, categories uh, on the App Store. And, um, and the basic goal is to increase our, uh, our user base uh, and make it wider. So uh, we're a publicly listed company in South Korea, so you could go to our website and take a look at all of our financials. Uh, 2011, we did around 42 uh, million dollars. Uh, we just announced our uh, 2012 figures yesterday. Uh, we did around 70 million dollars. Uh, that's if you take um, put the currency exchange rate as uh, one dollar equals a thousand Korean won. And we're uh, we've been profitable uh, for a very long time. Last year we did around 24 million dollars uh, in profit. So. We've been going through all the steps that uh, most of the developers he here have been going through. Uh, we started out doing uh, premium games on the App Store. We launched games at $4.99, and then we started doing hev heavy discounts on all of the games, changed it to 99 cent games. Uh, we also expanded to multi-platform. Multi we were uh, on iOS, we moved to Android. We also tried PSP minis, Nintendo DSi Wear. Uh, and then we also um, tried to expand our distribution networks as much as possible, too. Uh, and then we also transitioned to free-to-play, and then we started doing uh, third-party publishing. And then we've been going uh, to the social gaming space and uh, starting uh, running our games as a service. So I think uh, everybody here is pretty familiar with all of these changes. And uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, 
it, it's, a, it's pretty awesome that uh, we, we've, we've managed to do this within like, it's only been like four years since the App Store came out. So um, it's, it's a really rapidly changing industry and I think um, your company has to be uh, ready to change all the time. Um, yes, uh, we're, we were a pretty local company, but um, in 2012, now 40% of our revenue comes uh, from outside of Korea. Uh, we fully transitioned to a smartphone company. We had some feature phone revenue in the past, but uh, last year, more than 93% of our revenues uh, were coming from smartphone. We also did the full transition from pay, pay to premium to uh, freemium, and now more than 90% of our revenues uh, come from in-app purchases. So, uh, what, so we, we've been doing a, a lot of uh, publishing and we partnered with more than 40, 40 companies uh, around the world uh, and we've done a lot of deals in the publishing space. And I think the idea is really simple. Uh, what, what the publisher do, should do is basically uh, do what the developers need. Um, uh, I, I could put it into four different categories. Uh, the biggest categories probably could be funding. Um, we help you with the user acquisition. We also help you with the monetization on uh, trying to improve uh, the revenues. And we also uh, give a lot of value on the distribution. I think the distribution part is becoming more and more important. And I'll walk you through uh, what type of, value, uh, what type of uh, distribution needs there are today. So there's a lot of different forms of funding. Um, in the traditional PC or console gaming space where the games were as a product, um, like just doing project funding or uh, just providing marketing fees uh, would have been a good answer to that. But it really doesn't work uh, when, when the games are run as a service. So uh, it, it, it needs a more tighter relationship. Uh, the developer and the publisher has to look at common goals. Uh, so we found out that it's much more easier to do uh, these type of deals based off of minimum guarantees so that the developer and the publisher has uh, the same goals to achieve or trying to mix the company in, in some way by equity or IP investment. Um, for, for marketing fees, um, like if you do it the traditional way, uh, the problem that happens is if, if once, once the publisher runs out of the marketing fees, it becomes nobody else's, nobody's product. Um, even though the developer wants to push it, the publisher might say no to marketing. Um, and uh, so we, I, we haven't um, experienced that ourselves, but we've been hearing a lot of those type of uh, stories from different de developers. Also, it's, it comes the same for the project funding. Once, uh, once the publisher pays all the money to the developer to fund the project, uh, we, may, we may need updates to the games and the developer may not be cooperative at that stance. So I think the industry itself uh, needs a different uh, framework for, uh, for publishing and uh, I think uh, the best way that worked uh, for, for us with our developers have been through minimum guarantees and these type of equity investments. So. <clears throat> On, on the user acquisition side, uh, there's a lot of different types of user acquisition tools uh, that the publishers use. Um, yeah, we, uh, we try to get uh, a lot of feature placements uh, with Apple and Google. Uh, we try to get as much press coverage as possible too. So there's a lot of those type of free app promotions that you could get uh, through third parties. Uh, and then we also uh, run a lot of third party uh, paid user acquisition campaigns. Uh, and uh, We've been a little bit slow on this side, but we're trying to ramp up uh, on this a little bit more. Uh, the biggest uh, uh, user acquisition tool that we have uh, right now is through our own network. We have more than 200 million installs. Uh, so it's been very effective for us to cross promote between our own titles. And I think it really helps when you have like a couple of uh, number one hits on the app stores. So one of the things uh, when the developers uh, when the developers come to the publisher with their title, I think uh, when you you should actually look at the title uh, that the publisher is is actually publishing and make sure that it's uh, using the similar 
uh, like demographics. We may have 200 million installs, but most of our users are like male teenagers uh, that are that like to enjoy mid-core to hardcore games, and it might be a really uh, tough game for us to publish if we're looking at a very casual match three type of game. So. Uh, so I think the developers should look at what the publishers uh, actually, what type of games the, the publishers have been publishing. Uh, you also should um, work together on uh, social network inter integration. I'm going to talk about uh, the other mobile social networks uh, that are out there. Um, but as you've been seeing through like uh, the success of uh, Candy Crush Seg Sega from King.com, uh, I think Facebook in you know, integration is also very important. So um, those are a lot. Of, uh, those are free user acquisition tools that you could use, and um, you should spend a lot of time with the publishers um, discussing about the social network integrations that you can. And as I mentioned before, um, you also have to make sure that you have some sort of uh, control over the external uh, user acquisition campaigns. So for us, we, uh, we actually deduct the, uh, the user acquisition cost from the net revenue that we generate because it's common interest when it comes to direct uh, user acquisitions. If, if a publisher has the obligation to do all the user acquisitions, they might be acquiring users uh, for their own network. And if the developers have uh, full control over that, then um, yeah, it could be a significant loss for the publishers too. And uh, that's the reason why we've been trying to uh, just uh, make, it, make it a common interest and deduct it from the net revenue. And so uh, I think this is one of the biggest conflict points uh, between the developers and publishers because uh, the developer op obviously wants uh, the publishers to push, push the game more, but the publisher might say, hey, it's not worth spending our money into it. So, so uh, we think the best way to do it is to put it out from both pockets, uh, if possible. And um, so a lot of publishers, like even like us, we, we work with around 40 developers. And I think um, the biggest tip that I would, I would give to the developers out there is to, to bug the publishers as much as possible. Um, uh, you, need, you need to get a, enough attention from, from the publishers and, you know, it's, it, it's human interaction. The more, the more you talk with the developers, the more you start caring about them. And, uh, and we also think um, if the developer is more aggressive, uh, we also think that the developer also uh, has, is much more eager to achieve the same goal that we, we try to achieve. So I think, um, yeah, my advice is um, when you're working with a publisher, try to bug them as much as possible. So um, for our internal cross-promotion, we have uh, our own SDK called Gameville Circle. It's just a cross simple cross-promotion tool where you could show uh, banners. Uh, we also have an offer wall. Um, it's, it's prohibited on the iOS side, but on Android, uh, Google doesn't have any restrictions on that, so we also do incentivize uh, installs. Uh, yeah, we do all the common things, uh, try to get to the press and uh, get our games covered. Uh, get featured by Apple, uh, do our Facebook page, our Twitter page, our YouTube page. Uh, we, we do all, all those type of marketing. On the monetization side, I think the biggest thing that I've been noticing is Asia's always been a free-to-play country. Uh, America has started to pick up with the free-to-play after, um, after Facebook started uh, picking up. I think the European developers are probably the latest in converting to uh, free-to-play, but I think through the success of uh, companies like Supercell, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, I, I don't have to talk about uh, why you have to convert to free-to-play uh, anymore. So yeah, in 2011, um, this is uh, data from AppAny, but even on the iOS side, uh, freemium already exceeded the revenues uh, from, uh, compared to premium. Uh, on Google Play, uh, it's, it's always pretty much been uh, freemium from the beginning. And um, right now, uh, most, of the de most of the revenues are coming from free freemium. And um, 
so these are some of the cases. Uh, Cartoon Wars and Air Penguin were, were not our titles. Uh, uh, Cartoon Wars, uh, we, we, we picked an app that was already on the App Store. It already reached the number one spot on the paid app, paid app chart. And then we talked with the developers and we actually uh, uh, got half of the IP. And so it was kind of an IP investment deal. So we put a lot of money up front in order to get the IP. But the first thing, and the first thing that we did was we changed the game from pay to freemium. And it was a huge success. So we made much more money revenue uh, off of freemium than we did, uh, when, than the developer originally did uh, from paid. And we also uh, launched multiple versions. We did all the Android launches from, for them. They were only on iOS. Uh, we, did, uh, we did Android launches for all four of their games. We also launched it on uh, Line, which is a social networking platform, uh, the biggest social networking platform in Japan, too. And it's, uh, it's, it, it's one of our top sellers today. And we've, uh, with Air Penguin, we, we first met the developers when they had a reference built. Uh, they started it out as a paid app. We also agreed to launch it as a paid app. Uh, it, it reached the number one spot on the App Store. It made like a million dollars uh, the first month after, uh, after we launched it. Um, it. It was higher than Angry Birds uh, for a week. And, um, and then what we did was uh, we converted it to a freemium, and we actually made more money uh, than we did from, from paid. So the, uh, it's... Converting a paid game to freemium is really hard because if the design isn't considered, considered from the beginning, uh, it might be a significant change. But what I did want to tell you is that um, we, like, we work with, we, I think we have, to have the expertise in, in freemium, free to play just because of the amount of titles that we launched. And every time we learn a new trick from one of the freemium games, we try to apply it to all of, all of our games that we have. So uh, I think we, um, as a publisher, we kind of have a knowledge base of uh, like what type of things would work on freemium. And I think that's one of the values that we could provide to the developers. And so I, I don't think all free, free to play games are the same. Uh, so there are uh, like, there were some games that we converted from a paid app to a free-to-play game. And we actually just changed the game to free and put, it, put in uh, in-app purchases, but we weren't really running the games as a service. Um, the majority of the games that we're, we've been launching these days are uh, run as a service, uh, meaning that we're doing a con constant update um, at least bi-weekly, and um, like, no, at least, uh, at least once once a month, and um, the, for the majority of our games, uh, we're, of, of the games that we're running as a service, we're updating like every week. So, um, these are the things that you have to think about when you're uh, working with a publisher, because the whole dynamic of the deal changes if you're running games as a service. You, you're you're gonna you're gonna start spending uh, more because you, you have to constantly s support the game after the launch. And um, it's, it's the same for the publishers, too. The publishers also have to constantly spend more time and, and uh, money on, on the game after launch. So I think the deal structure shouldn't be finite in any ways. It should, uh, the, the, the deal structure should also uh, have, have the thing considered uh, from the beginning. And as you see, like, we, we just started doing games as a service. Um, in the fourth quarter of 2011, we had 0% of revenue coming from games as a service. Um, in the last quarter uh, that we just announced, uh, uh, now more than 40% of our revenues are coming from games as a service. And as we're, as we're running games as a service, um, so we have to think about the uh, update plans, and we also have to think about the server cost. Um, uh, when you're when you're uh, striking a deal with the a publisher, you also have to uh, think how you're going to deal with the uh, server cost. We were pay we were paying nothing um, on server costs just for a simple amount of money through our IDC uh, in the past, but now like uh, we've been using Amazon Cloud, and last 
Last year, we, all, we already surpassed uh, paying more than six-digit figures uh, to Amazon. And uh, so these server costs could also rack up, and uh, these are some of the things that you should uh, discuss thoroughly with, with the publishers. We also spend a lot of time on QA, just because you're doing uh, update every week. That also means uh, our, our QA team has to, has to test all of your games uh, every week, too. Um, and also customer support. Every time you do an update, there's a new set of customer support uh, that, that the publishers also have to do. And uh, there, so the relationship between the developer and publisher is becoming more and more tighter. So uh, finally, I'm gonna talk about the distribution channels. And um, so we, these are the current channels that we're, we're distributing through. Uh, uh, we, we do um, the App Store and Google Play. We also do Amazon apps. Um, we also do carrier stores in South Korea. The carrier stores in South Korea are bigger than our, our revenues that we have uh, globally. So the T-Store, Ole Market, U+, um, we also do Samsung apps. Uh, we're also uh, working with the social networks in, in Kakao, like Kakao and Line. And it's big and it's huge in Asia. So I don't have to talk about the world population. And this is the Google Play revenue. Uh, if you, as you see, the Google Play revenue from the United States is almost similar to South Korea and Japan. And the other countries uh, portion is also increasing significantly. So the localization is becoming more and more important and these Asian markets are becoming more and more important for you. Uh, you probably know all of these companies because they're all Western developers. This is on iOS. But on Google Play, like half of them, five of them are from Korea, five of them from Japan. So if you're, if you, Google, um, Google Play is growing uh, at a really fast pace. Android is growing at a really fast pace. And if you don't have a reach to these markets, you're missing out a huge chunk of revenue. So that's part of the reasons why we also opened an office in Japan uh, in 2011, and we're also planning to open an office in China this year too. So we're, we're in the key smartphone markets right now, and um, I hope Europe becomes one uh, pretty soon too. So uh, these are some examples of our games. Monster Warlord, uh, we launched it first on the Korean carriers. We went up to close to a million downloads, and then we launched it on Google Play. Uh, going surpassed two million dollars uh, downloads, and then um, like, so we've been adding more and more uh, channels every every uh, every every time uh, the developers are ready to do so. Uh, same for Punch Hero. We just exceeded eight million downloads for Punch Hero. Um, so we launched it on all of all of these channels. All of these channels really add up, and you got to have reach into all of these in order to make uh, good revenue. Um, the carrier stores are really powerful, like the T-Store. Uh, our games have been doing really well here. And um, the last thing that I want to talk about is the social networks. Uh, Line, Kakao, and WeChat, they all are uh, mobile social networks that are very important. 70 million users on Kakao, 100 million users on Line. They're the biggest uh, social networks in South Korea and Japan. Uh, 300 million on WeChat, which is uh, from China. And they, they also recommend games. So um, in they, the daily active user base is almost about half of their total users. So like Kakao has like 30 million uh, active use, daily active users. So they can drive uh, games to up the charts on in, any, uh, in, in the Korean store really easily. You can also use the social graphs uh, from them, just like Facebook can. And so, you, you, you got to pay more attention to um, app, app distribution. And uh, the last thing that I, w I wanted to talk about is some of our developers have been saying uh, we're really happy with the funding, user acquisition, monetization, and distribution that Gameville provides. But w one of the developers were saying that uh, they felt kind of left out because we weren't paying personal attention. They wanted to be more friends with us and have more drinks together. And uh, so I think this is one of the, one of the things that uh, we're, we've been putting more time and effort into. So we have a huge team of uh, producers um, to provide attention. Uh, we're trying to do more exhibitions uh, for our developers. Uh, so we were out at G-Star last year. 
And yeah, so through this experience uh, working with a lot of uh, developer partners, uh, I think we gained a lot of knowledge. And I don't think it's a hobby project anymore for us. 44% of our revenues came from third party titles. And if you calculate this, this is uh, $31 million uh, last year. We, we did around four, 40 titles. So if you do the math, I, I'm not sure if I'm correct, but it's at least like $800,000 uh, per developer that we've, we've been paying out. So yeah, to find the right, this is a conclusion, to find the right partner, you get the right funding option, utilize all the user acquisition channels that are available, maximize the revenue uh, through freemium, attack all the distribution channels available, especially Asia, and also confirm dedicated at attention uh, from the publisher. So thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. And for me, what I've been struggling with is to work out what the role of the publisher was in this new mobile age. And I think you've just illustrated to me some really key factors. Because distribution is more complex than it used to be. You can't go to a retail channel and buy space in a game store anymore. Uh, and we can't do the same, those things in the Google and the uh, Android, uh, sorry, the Google and the iOS app stores. But there are app stores out there in regional areas where publishers who've got those relationships, who can maintain, sustain those relationships, can add value. So it's not just about the money. It's also about the expertise. And I think the one thing that I, I'm going to take away from that particular conversation you've just given us is that it's also about understanding how to continue the service experience after the launch. And I think if that's where publishers like GameVilla are going to move, they can really add value that independent developers on their own can't necessarily offer. I still think there's room for indies. I hope there is anyway. Um, but enough of me talking. Any questions? Anyone got any questions out there? We have a couple. So, um, I know we touched that a couple of times already today, but the other guys were, let's say, very reserved when it came to the subject of getting featured and mm -hmm. now you touched it again so mm -hmm. I was trying or I'm trying to push this again and ask if you could maybe give some insights uh, well I think yeah as Oscar mentioned um, if you're if you if you have like one to two titles and you want to maintain a, re app, a relationship with Apple or Google it's gonna be really hard um, uh, and I think one of the reasons why it we've been more lucky on getting featured is because we have a steady flow of, uh, of games that we can communicate with Apple and they, they ha also have some type of expectations uh, on what type of games are coming from us too. Um, of course, the, e even for us, if we bring a low quality title to them, they won't accept it. Uh, so uh, relationships don't value over the, the quality of the titles. Uh, but at least what I, um, the value that we could give is at least we could pr present it to the platform holders. Um, you, I'd actually echo that quite strongly because although it was only a, 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 an operator deck that I was running, um, the number of companies coming to me in sort of 2003, 2005 was huge. You know, and I could not possibly manage that. Okay, we were a small team. I'm sure Apple and Google have bigger teams. But it gets to a point where human beings cannot cope with those number of contacts. And they're going to inevitably... Uh, you know, have to find people that they can have a trusted relationship with an ongoing pipeline. Yeah, but I think uh, Apple and Google is doing a really good job trying to reach out to as many um, indie developers as possible. They want a good, healthy mix on their app stores, and they don't want to look reliant on a couple of publishers, too. But as, as Oscar mentioned, um, they're, they're a pretty small team, and um, it's really hard to reach out to more than 100 developers, if you think about it. And they're pretty, pretty bomb bombarded with all the emails that they get from all over the world. There was another question. Thank you. Um, at what point does Gameville like to be uh, introduced to a new title? I mean, from a napkin scribble to a vertical slice. Where do you guys like to be involved and want to be presented uh, with a new title? Well, uh, yeah, we, we'd at, at least want to take a look at prototypes. There's, uh, I think we're getting pitched with too many titles that it's hard for us to invest into anything that's on paper. Uh, so, uh, if, but if it becomes too late, there, um, 
and we ask for changes, then the developers also get frustrated too. So um, like once you have a prototype that we feel comfortable with the execution and uh, we feel comfortable uh, with what type of game it is, uh, I think that would probably be the perfect timing. Any more questions? I'm gonna sneak in one. Oh, there's one over the corner. Here. Um, hello. Outside of Korea and Japan, which have very specific carrier markets, uh -huh. how important do you see on Android the carriers in the future? And what about the, all the fragmentation and building? How do you deal with that in the freemium space? So um, I think the, the most valuable asset that the carriers had was carrier billing. But a lot of carriers gave that up to, uh, to Google um, just because uh, they, they're more interested in gaining smartphone penetration right now. And, and if you're a small carrier, it's really hard to get attention from a specific uh, handset manufacturer. So unless you're like Verizon uh, or Vodafone, um, it's really hard for you to, to try to build up your own store. But I know that uh, I think both of them kind of gave up on that side too. So uh, right now, I think Korea is one of the one of the only unique markets that ha uh, where the carriers have a strong influence. I think China's also a pretty close market so, uh, that the carriers will have a stronger influence. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's really hard to find. Uh, I, I come to Mobile World Congress every year just to find out if there is a new, new uh, carrier try driving that really heavily, but none of them really have seemed to uh, manage to make any commercials success yet. I think China's an interesting one, actually, because um, uh, Papaya was a Beijing-based company, and we found that there were around 72 app stores. And yes, the operator ones were very strong. Some OEMs were OK, but it was some underground uh, app stores that were actually driving a lot of the revenue, too. Yeah. Some of them were tied to the social uh, media groups as well. So I think increasingly we'll find more diversity in the kind of app stores that are proving useful. China's going to be a huge market, and uh, yeah, I think if, if you get China uh, Android correct on chi uh, in China, I think you're already successful. It's, it's been a hard, hard market for, even for us. We're still working on it. There's another question there. Hi. Um, how, can you please tell us, how do you manage refunds? So even after the 15-minute refunding policy from Google, mm -hmm. how do you manage those with, a, with the end user? Thank you. So uh, it's, it, we, we, we've been changing that. We've actually been tr checking out like, how other companies have been doing that too. Um, I've noticed that a lot of companies uh, like, don't answer emails. <laughs> and uh, the other half is like, they refund uh, everything. Uh, so for us, uh, we, we try to figure out if it was an accidental purchase or not. And if, if the user kind of shows some sort of proof that, the, uh, that their kid accidentally uh, did it, we've been doing refunds. Yes, the amount of customer support on Android has, uh, is significantly large compared to uh, iOS because you, you actually have to take care of all the transactions. So that's all we have time for. I wanted to go into the debate we were having on Monday night about Eastern games versus Western games and how that works, but sadly not enough time. We'll have to do that over more beer later. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Kelly. Thank you. And uh, I, that was a great presentation. Thank you very much.